Hey, it's MJ from the Coaches Panel. I hope you're well and welcome back to another AFL Fantasy Strategy Roundtable where we talk with you about some of the big moves that you need to consider and make heading into the upcoming week of AFL Fantasy. There's a lot to get through on this episode. So whether you're watching this on YouTube, we see a little bit of a different background to what I'm normally working with. Snuck away on a quick break, but have not forgot you have got this podcast for you lined up or you're listening into the audio episode. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode from the Coaches Coaches panel. Joining me on this, it's been a minute since we've done one of these for an AFL fantasy strategy roundtable, but we've hooked it up nonetheless. Joining me on this episode, fellow co-founder, 2020 Dream Team champion, and looking to be able to add 2023 AFL fantasy champion to that resume. It's Rids. Hello, mate. How are you? 2023 champion. We're going back a year. 2024. Well, I'm nearing a landmark birthday in my life, so maybe I've just got us in my subconscious right now where I'm trying to just reverse the age somewhere. I think that's what I'm doing. <laughs> that's all good. Hey, oh, man, that's fair enough you. too. There, so. Yeah. Oh, I don't blame myself. Um, there's a bunch of stuff I want to ask you. There is probably about 15 to 20 players. Normally we talk a lot of strategy and we do want to hit that, but I feel like these player movements that people are looking at ultimately are unlocking a lot of strategic mindsets of how we move in. But really, we've got to talk heading into round four. This is gather round for us in AFL fantasy as well as across the entirety of the AFL. It's the first time in three weeks since every single AFL club has played, which means we're no longer in best 18 territory. Ritz, we're back to 22 on field and none of our garbage scores falling off. There's been some portions of the community, mate, that are seeing this as a challenging round. Others are seeing it as a kind of the true reality of where team builds are currently with the actual scores of what you place on field counting. As we head into this round, and it's a short week of footy with Monday afternoon the game ends and Thursday afternoon or evening it starts up again. Uh, what's your take on gather round and returning to a best 22 on field? Well, I don't really have a take on gather round. The only thing with gather round, though, is you're going to get a little bit more diverse like venues over the weekend because they are going out to the country football teams, um, the grounds a bit. You know, they're going out to Mount Barker, for instance. They're going out to Norwood. Um, they're not playing multiple, like, you don't have to travel to West Coast, okay? Or you don't have to go over to Tasmania, to Canberra, to Sydney. There's You don't have to have the elements of the weather on everywhere. It's all going to be one, you know, one fits all. So it's great. I, I actually like the idea. I think it's awesome. Um, but for fantasy, it's going to be a bit of a challenge, I think, because um, – some of the guys we want to go to may not have the greatest of venues for their matchups. You know, some of the other guys, like, I mean, not everywhere is going to be played like it's the Adelaide Oval. You know what I mean? Hmm. Yeah, 100%. Um, there are some portions of the community, you mentioned this idea of uh, maybe a bit more scoring diversity. We've seen players like a Darcy Wilson, probably has fallen off a lot of people's scores last week, that 35, or the low 20s score from a Blake Howes, or even a fortnight or a week earlier, like a Nick Dacos for their owners where he drummed up a 61. I think coaches were hoping that that score fell away. Um, do you see coaches that are running different strategy elements? And we are seeing different strategies, some running a, a Caulfield, Hoare, um, and, and even a Howe sort of defensive combo. I know two of those guys are out injured at the moment. Some are running three midfield rooks on field. Some are running as deep as four. Um, and then others are running one or two through that forward line. Do you think team structures this week are going to, and I use this word loosely, by the way, be found out? No, I don't, think they, I don't think they will. It's a go. little bit. Sorry, mate, you just Talk broke through up that, a little man. bit. But um, I don't think they will be found out. There's going to be a little bit of that. You might get the odd, you know, 20, 40 points per structure, but then some people that have extra rookies on field may have the high top-end guys. So as long as those guys continue to pop, 
then I, I think it's going to balance out a little bit. I think it's been overstated a degree, saying that, you know, if you have a defender D6 on field, yeah, that's great. You might be having a look at a house versus a mass, for instance, okay? That might only be a 30-point, 40-point swing at the biggest, like, you know, at the greatest value. Like, it's it doesn't really matter because just as long as that dollars that you have are spelt, sp- like, well, spent elsewhere to make up, It doesn't really matter. So it's not going to be a position per se. It's going to be more what's your strategy, what's your structure, because we're not playing for round four. You know what I mean, MJ? We are playing for a longer-term game here. There's going to be teams that are on value, trying to build team values. There might be teams that have gone a pure guns and rook, like and I hate talking about my team, for instance, but I've got three hmm. rucks at this point in time, you know, because I'm looking at that cash gen of the three rucks. It's just going to be different. It's not going to be right. It's not going to be wrong. And you know what? The thing that we have seen is the mid rookies are looking great. I get that, hmm. radio, and they look like they're the solid. But don't forget that the top end me like the top end, mid, like the mids, like there is a greater difference. You've got that 110, 115 at the top end, but then you've got the rookies going at that 65, 70, you know. So that there is about 50, 60 points spread between the top ends to the actual rookies. If you go to the forward line, yes, I know that, Someone like a Darcy um, Wilson didn't have the greatest week last week, but he was going at 55s and 60s the weeks before. You know, yeah. someone like Lazaro has come out and popped a couple of 50s. Harley hmm. Reid, that everyone seems to be, like, worried about, he's going 50s. Like, I well, mean... And then Cadman, Gallagher's, Dempsey. Like, there's a bounty of these options through there for us. So take out Heaney, okay? Everyone not named Heaney right now. I mean, what are we talking? 90s, 95s? Yep. Powell, like, Jackson, these, you know, Flanders and 90 ish guys. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's only a 40 point spread from that top. So I think it's been overstated. I think the focus has been directed at the wrong spots at times. It's not who you have at D6, for instance. It's what you do with the money if you've taken a bit of a haircut at D6 and where is it? Does it mean you can, you know, have a Bonner at M6? Like, does it mean you can have, like, whoever it is? It's not a pure, this is a mid-pricer versus a rook in a position. It's going to be across the whole team. Because we're all playing different strategies to get to the end of the year, yeah? A hundred percent we are. And I think that kind of leads in nicely to the next thing I want to talk to you about. And like I said, there are a bunch of players I want to get your opinions on through this episode. But we do have a bunch of impending DPPs that are actually getting really quite close to us. Now, historically, in AFL Fantasy, and it's the same for all the other formats, it would be heading into round six. However, that is not the case for 2024. Yep, I finally got my year right. The reason being, due to opening round and all of the buys that have happened and will still to come, they've made the decision they want everybody to have had the opportunity for equal amount of games and then the positional allocations will roll in. So historically, it's pre-round six. In 2024, it's post-round six. So you've got to get through four, five, and six. So three more weeks left to go. But I think we will do a video episode on this in the next week or two, Rids, but there's a bunch of different guys that are going to change up and reveal some strategic elements that coaches have either lucked into or planned or based their team around. So I'm talking Roberts getting defensive status, Nick Martin getting defensive status. Um, These will actually drastically change up what our midfields and our defensive lines look at, let alone if someone like a Riley Sanders, for example, picks it up and we can really change things up. It, It does feel like this year these 
impending DPPs will come. I know there's probably about 50 others um, that we could arguably talk about, but my goodness me, this really will change up team structures and potentially the way they're going to play these next few weeks. Yeah, but I, but we're not really looking at it in totality, are we? We're, we're acting, we're reactive at the moment. We're going, we want to go get someone off a buy. So we're all looking at uh, Sam Flanders this week, just say, or whether it's a Tom Green this week or whether it's a Took Miller this week. We're looking at these guys. But have we actually seen what is available in the big picture? Do you own a Nick Martin? Is he going to swing back in your defensive line? I've seen that some of these defensive lines going down to D7, D8, MJ, right now. Well, what's going to happen when you get McKercher going back? You're going to have Roberts going back. You might even Bonner have a Bonner back. going go back. back. Yeah. Martin, what about Fisher in the forward line? Like, mm. there's a whole heap of people, okay, at the moment that are going to gain that sort of role. What's going to happen when Sanders? Now, we're all going to have Sanders, yeah? But when we move the Martins out and the McCurches out, we're going to find ourselves, we're going to have a big, big hole in that midfield. Are we going to have to go and look at a Jai Clark at times if we don't get this right? And it's going to be a fine balance, mate. It's going to be a juggle. You're going to go, well, is it a Zach Williams? I'm seeing people trade out Zach Williams this week, mate. Mm. Well, why not just let him go through to round seven and then upgrade him to a midfielder or a forward, whoever's the most appropriate, you could still play these rookies in the midfield, but the problem we're going to have is there's going to be some smart coaches out there that are going to have this already set, are going to really start building that midfield quickly and having the players in their dedicated positions to really start understanding where they are at. Because MJ, you think about it, mate, and we just look at our teams for a second, okay? You've probably got two premiums, okay, over the price of 850 right now in your defensive sure. line, yeah? So I'm just going to throw out two popular names. Let's just go Sheasel and Stewart, okay? Yep. It could be a Whitfield. So we're going to have it two of them. It could be a Dacos, you know, two of these sort of 850 plus guys, sure. Okay, mate. And then let's look at Young. Most teams have Young, okay? That's a given. If you don't have Young, then you probably have a Jordan Clark. So hmm. straight away, you've got that. So we've already got three spots taken. Elliot Yo looks amazing right now. He's mm -hmm. going to, if he stays on the park, big if, but if he stays on the park, he's going to be. as good as the options we've got. He's yep. as close to a D6 as you can possibly get. We got guys like, if you don't own Nick Dacos right now, you'll be targeting Nick Dacos very soon because he's bottling now. Yep. So you're going to want him in there. So suddenly you've got three premiums. You might own Nick Martin, who's very popular. So he's he's going well enough to be a defensive premium, yeah? Mm -hmm. So straight away you've got four premiums and you've got Yo and you've got Young on top of mm -hmm. that, especially if you've already targeted a day cost. Like, I mean... It's we're gonna have a chockers backline in what round seven, just say hypothetically. We're three weeks away from it, and, and this is where you talk about different teams probably aren't gonna get caught out this week going to 22 on field. And and being caught out is probably a bit too much of a dramatic term, but you know, I, I love a little bit of an exaggeration. It's more gonna be round seven and eight. And the reason you talk about it, if they can flip a McKercher back, they can move a Martin back, they can move a Bonner back, they can move whoever it is around. Yeah, sure, put your Sharp on field, put your Clark on field, no problems, quote unquote. But these guys are gonna be able to move other options into the midfield, make these upgrades. There's some guys that will be under or around 900,000 that I think we would all say at the start of the year were top-line midfield premiums. And based on how they're structuring up their side at the moment, 
They're four weeks away from going bang, bang to getting two of these big liners, locking in that day cost, getting in that forward premium that they want that might actually pop through there. So you're right. These DPPs are equally, if not more so, going to impact what our teams look like in four weeks and even what this best 22 weeks week looks like for us. And that's half the battle, Radio. And we're yeah. entering, I wouldn't say, I know I've heard people say that we're in upgrade season now, but the fact is, why are we forcing this? It's only round four. Like, yeah. I mean, if you can do it, you can do it. Great. But sure. I don't think we're going to have enough dollars in our teams right now to be able to go big upgrade, big upgrade, big upgrade, big upgrade, big upgrade through to, say, round eight or nine week after week with one down and one up. Let these guys yeah. fatten a bit. Like, there's no rush. And especially with best 18 next week and the week after, and then we still got four rounds of best 18 right in the middle of the season, it's it's one of those ones, yeah? You've got to have that delicate balance because the last thing you want to do is you go culling and guess what? You're losing because who are we trading into, MJ? Who are the two most important players with the biggest break-evens this week? It's Harvey Thomas and Harvey Gallagher. And the mm. thing is, both of them have were, what, 40 merchants, 50 merchants beforehand? Do we really yep. want to have those sort of guys on our field? Because we just culled too quick. Like, if you, and you know, someone like a Jeremy Sharp, okay? He's been good, perfect. Yep. His break yep. even's now starting to bounce up into the positives. I think it's about 11 or something at the moment. Yeah, it might two to three weeks week. away from topping out. Yep. Yeah, two or three weeks. See, he's colourable, you know, in the next week or so, yeah? Maybe the two rounds away. It's, you can't cull him, okay? But who are we culling him to? What are the rookies that are coming along? I mean, there's a Richmond rookie that should be named this week. That, McCall if, yep. Yep, so he's potentially one. There's an Ari in the Ari Shawmaker um, from yep. the Saints. There's a couple coming through. but Yeah, you wouldn't be shocked if Ryan to, from the Crows gets a go, yep. And maybe the Hawthorne back, the Phillips. Yeah, I mean, the thing Phillips, is, yep. yeah, so there, there could be guys coming through, but are they – Really, do we want to jump on them blind just because we're trying to force it? Yeah, and there's uh, plenty it's of definitely ways. There. Well, there's plenty of ways to do this. Now, I said this a couple of weeks ago, okay, or last week, or wherever it was. There is a possibility that we are waiting too long as well. So, because depending on whose the strategies are, like it's going to be interesting. This week is going to be massively interesting because we got the Tom Green owners coaches coming back. We got the Lockie Whitfield coaches coming back. We Flanders, got the Sam Miller. Flanders Miller. Yeah. You know, this is a really, really interesting week, and there's a best twenty-two aspect to it, and that's what we should be focusing on. Now, people who went well last week may, you know, dip a couple of hundred points this week. Yep. And that's fine if you do that because guess what? We've got another two best 18s and you've got to kind of have those ups and those downs as the year progresses while everyone's finding their feet and while everyone's running a different strategy. I said the three ruck teams out there at the moment, mm. guess what they've got right now? Now, they might not have had nailed every rookie and they sure. might have, they might have, but the fact that they've got Cherry there and they've got mm. Gorn there, that's a lot of cash, MJ. And the fact yeah. that Grundy's going in now and starting to generate some cash, but that doesn't mean they're any worse off. It just means that their points on field are probably going to be at a lower air point because whenever right that timing happens right now, you go straight to a Flanders in one trade, really, MJ, if you actually plan for it, or you can go to a Tom Green. They've got an easy way to get to a Bontempelli or a, mm. whoever it is. And just as long as they're 
their cash build was in the ballpark and mm. their points, you know, is comparable to the top ranked teams. Why? That's a great strategy, but we won't know the outcome of it until post mid season buys, like everything. Yeah. 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 We're, we're eight to 10 weeks away from really seeing different teams' strategies and approaches. I'm seeing teams, even in the top 50, I'm seeing teams that have you know, got that 18.1 team value, a million, and teams that are like 18.6, 18.7. So we are seeing teams do it differently, and we will, as you mentioned, see some of those compounding things change over this next eight to ten weeks. There's a bunch of players I want to ask you about, Rids, um, that really I feel will largely impact a lot of the strategy decisions coaches will make this week. And so I want to ask you about every single one of these players and get your take on them as options. Let's start with probably one of the most popular downgrade options this week in Harvey Thomas. Popped a ton for us against the Eagles before the buy. He's now got a negative break even of not minus 22 and has really bumped that average up. But as you mentioned beforehand, hadn't even cracked anything over 50 prior to this. How important is he as a trade option for us this week? Well, I think he makes enough cash. And the thing is, you can actually do him at an F8 or a util at this point in time, okay? So he's likely to make, you know, 150000 in the next two to three weeks. So I think he's almost at that point now where you go, yeah, I think the cash is worth it. If you can hit that hundred to 150000 on that player to be increased, that means it's a much easier downgrade slash jump sideways to a mid pricer, whatever you want to do later in the season. So I think this guy is going to be very important for us. Now, the things that we do need to watch out here is mid forward. That's very, very handy. I know that in AF we've got the util and we can sub in and out, but the, having that ability to be able to swing is great, especially with our trades. The second thing yeah. to watch with this though, is he has a round 12 buy. So I don't think any team would want to hold him until round 12. But the problem is, if he does have a really poor game next week or this week, that really means that his cash gen stalls, he, he may be stuck in your team as one of those dead bench rookies for a long period of time. It, it's I wouldn't want him on the field at all um just historically again based outside of that one game he struggled to get to 50 but I, I agree with you i think if if this is the way it gets you to the upgrade that you want um and or it's just that activation of cash into your team i, I don't mind it sam flanders is probably one of the top trade priorities this week rids i think we know that role looks really strong and and he, while he might not be popping those 130s uh, of late of 2023 He's still showing that he's got that strong scoring component about him. His break even, his average is pretty much net neutral. He's still under 850k, 850k, but very, very highly owned for us. Team dependent, I know, is the answer that yourself and Mini Mike always like to give when it comes to trading priorities. But how important is Flanders this week? Oh, he's important, but it's not just for this week. Yeah. So the fact of the matter is he's averaging 103 right now. That's heavily inflated with that 120 score a couple of weeks ago or whatever it was, 119 a couple of weeks ago. So, But the thing is, he is going to be a top six forward for the year. There's no problems mm. about that. He's 840. He's, he's priced at about 90 at this point in time. Is he absolutely going to hurt you and burn you right now? Not this week because he is playing at a venue that may not be as suited to his game style and against an a opposition. Bit more suburban footing. Yeah, it's else. going to be a little bit, but he is still. I'm. You know, I've been doing this for a long time. Yeah, I've I've said this. I said this earlier today to um, a couple of people that I know, um, Elise and um, Eloise. Sorry, and Liam. And I sort of said, whenever I have the opportunity to go to the big dog, 
I just don't muck around. I just take the big dog. I know there might be other options at the time, but I don't want to get too cute with it because often what you find is you get tripped up. You know, you plan for them in two weeks and then suddenly a couple of bullets hit, something else happens and suddenly you don't go and you just miss them for four weeks, five weeks. So if you have the possibility and you've been planning for it anyway, Sam Flanders is a great upgrade this week. But it depends who you're going from as well. It's all about how you get there, yeah. Yeah, so if it's coming from a James Jordan, Happy days, yeah. If it's going from a failed mid price uh, midfielder, let's say I'm thinking Wines, can, who's injured, Wines, yep. who's injured, absolutely gun trade. So it's all about, but if you do it from Luke Jackson right to this week, probably not the worst play out problem on your list right now. You might have seen that Sean Darcy's at expected back next week but what happens with sean darcy as we always knows he's always an extra couple of weeks away even when we expect him to come back next week so the thing is there are don't force it i feel that's a bit of a force and you jump in at a shadow per se wait for them to come back and then to be named and to do that if that's the way you're going to do it he needs another instance a example mj Right yep. now, he's going 20 points. This is ridiculous, yeah? He's averaging 20 points better than the number two averaging forward. And That's if incredible. you told me a couple of months ago, when we were crying poor about the forward premiums right now, that the top three, or let's just say the top four, are averaging three mm. or four are averaging 100. I think Sam Flanders is 99.3 or something. Yeah, he is. Uh, yeah. But two of them, the three of them are Heaney, Zorko, and Harry McKay. McKay. <laughs> like, we were whinging, carrying on like pork chops, yeah? We don't even know whether we were going to start Fisher at F1 a couple of months ago, <laughs> well, a couple of weeks ago. Like, this is... <laughs> So the fact of the matter is we do have options. We do know what we're doing. We just got to be prepared to have a look and to live outside the box that we live in. Yeah. I still don't think I still don't think, mate, that the forwards is the place that you want to spend the dollars at this point. Okay, interesting. Well, speaking of spending the dollars, um, up over a million now is Tom Green. He's had a phenomenal start to the year. Talk about getting into the best, 127 is his average. His break-even, well, based on current form, he should only continue to make money. Is it just too much money too early in the season to be going and getting him now? Or is knowing, and there are a few players I want to get your take on in a minute that are under a hundred thousand, or in fact, more than a hundred thousand cheaper than what green is right now. You talk about getting the best when you can afford the best. Is now the time to do that with green? I think that's forcing it for green right now. Okay, he's averaging 127, his break even's yeah. 111. Like, he's not going to average 100. I'm not, I shouldn't say it like that, yeah. Because he's young, he's a gun. We know he's a it's gun. It's unlikely that he'll average 127. Let's go with that. I'm then. pretty safe in saying, like, it's been a while since we've had someone go over 120 in this season. Like, I think um, mm-hmm. the last one would have been Tom Mitchell a few years back. Yeah, um, Steele and Miller did it not too long ago, yeah. Uh, yeah, but Laird did it a couple of years ago as well. Yeah. But, the, but that's I mean, the thing. This is we're well talking past high hundred and twenties. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. remember a couple of years ago, Tom Rockliffe did hundred and thirties. Dane Swan was a hundred and thirties. Ablett, you know, we that was that's the type of um, company Tom Green's facing right now. Even Marcus yeah. Bonsapelli, who had an amazing year last year, only went at one hundred and seventeen. And I yeah. know people will say, "Oh, yeah," but he started slow and everything. But the fact is, he still only went one hundred and seventeen. It's such an awkward price, especially for mids. And we've seen it just recently, MJ. And you're going to be Mm. asking me about guys who are starting to bottom out. We're talking about, Mm -hmm. did you think we would ever say that Goulden was going to drop the values that he has? That Bonson No, people thought he was safe. Yeah. Yeah. Bonson Pelly was definitely safe. 
you think about the draw for inside mids. It was amazing. Guess what? For him. Yeah. Yeah. He's not that much. He's not safe anymore, is he? Now he's getting safer because of the what price he's priced yeah. at. Yeah. But the fact is, like, what we tend to overdo is look at the dollars and then relate and think that people are just going to go and match it at times. And yeah. When we have value across the teams like we had this year with the rucks, with the mids, with the forwards, we tend to spend up because we always have extra money left over, you know, after. Mm. So that's where the challenge is. If I've got it, do I spend up? Well, yeah, you can, but you've got to be very, very lucky to nail that one in 10 safe option that is going to exceed their price point at that point. Well, and it's Tom been green, green and it's been sarong. Yeah, outside of green and sarong over that 59.60. Like Rosie's been okay. Like he's held his range, so I wouldn't be too disappointed there. But really that upper echelon, guys, it, it, it's been two of them and not much else. Um, talk to me about Lockie Whitfield then, Riggs, you talk about the defensive line might not be the spot to be trading into just with the bounty of options that are coming through. We've listed them already, but Roberts, McKercher, Bonner, all heading into the back line and a Fisher. Um, where does Lockie Whitfield sit in a trade cadence priority for you now? He's been awesome, had a great opening round score, and has been good since then. Again, should we be prioritising elsewhere in our teams? We feel it's really awkward, yeah, because it's an awkward mm. conversation. This guy can actually – he's got history, we feel. He, he's done this before. But you know what he's also done, MJ? He's gone out and had an early in-game injury or he's missed games through suspensions or he, mm. whether it's concussions, whether it's hamstrings, whether whatever has happened – Whitfield's given us one of those roller coaster rides along the journey. I, if you don't own Whitfield right now, I would be holding off until after the mid season buy. If you own Whitfield right now, enjoy the ride. 100%. Uh, yeah, I don't go forecasting or jumping at shadows that something's going to happen. Just enjoy the ride. Just be aware that there is history there, yeah? There are history bumps for sure. One of the most popular trade-ins last week was a Tom Powell. Um, our boy, okay, maybe maybe we're getting too excited. Technically, I traded him to you in a, in a keeper league during the offseason, so maybe I've lost my claim to be able to say he's my boy, but he's going at 98 at the moment. Got a, still a very nice break even. He's he's going to make uh, and hit over that 700000 price tag, no problem. I guess my question for you about Tom Powell is twofold. One... Should we be prioritising him over Sam Flanders with a 200000 price difference? And then the second question, is this scoring continuation going to hold and, and is he going to be a 90-95 plus scoring forward for us for the year? Well, mate, he's young enough, yeah? So, you know, there's, there's no history there because he didn't have a role before. His body might not, it might not have been ready to take the role, okay? He, whether it was Simpkin being in the midfield last year, whether it was Cunnington the year before, whatever's happened has happened, but Powell's ready to pop. He was prolific as a junior. He was huge as a junior in this role. Amazing. And he's the number one CBA guy for North Melbourne in the midfield. So, like outside of the ruck, but... Mm. It's him. It's Tom Powell. I just don't understand why you doubt that. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm not saying you, but anyone. No, no, no. The royal you, yes. Yes. Like, the fact of the matter is, if you got a Jack Billings problem this week, if you've got a Nate Fife problem this week, what's the easiest pivot you could do in your forward line, MJ? Uh Tom Powell, and it's not going to cost you much. So let me just show you quickly for those watching uh, over on YouTube. Uh, he's at 546K Nat 5. So really, it's a $100,000 movement. A, a Jack Billings, 564K. It's around about 100000 you've got to find. And also James 
Jordan, you could probably throw into the mix of that as well. They do have West Coast this week, so the matchup is right. But again, you want to get into Powell. They're all pretty much 100,000 that you've got to make which is very, very easy to get, especially if Thomas is one of your downgrade options. And for the best 22, mate, if you turn, let's just say a Jordan, and I know it's going one week early from his buy, but the fact of the matter is his break-even's 54. Yep. How much is he going to burn you? Well, if he pops an 80, what, 15,000, 20,000 in cash gen. And you're moving him next week anyway at the buyer to be poor. And Powell's going to match that anyway with his dollars that he goes up. So you're Correct. still jumping on a value. I don't know whether Powell's going to maintain this for the whole year or not, but who cares if he does or doesn't? doesn't right now, he's on a burst and he's on a run and he's making cash and he's scoring points. Don't argue with that. Don't be stubborn. Just jump into him. If you've got a Billings or a whoever problems sitting there, and I think the majority yeah. of us do have one of those three. Billings, Fife, Jordan. I think we've got at least one of those. I know some might put Fisher in that consideration as well. Um, but, yeah, for me, I would, if I was a non-PAL owner and going, oh, do I want to get PAL or Flanders this week? The $200,000 I could reactivate elsewhere. Flanders' price is going to be barely moving if he goes a flat line ton this week, whereas if Powell goes another ton, you're jumping on another 50000 sort of price movement and he's over 700 k So you're well, I'll really put it into, to me. Yeah. I'll put it into names just so people Please. out there can actually understand. 200000 okay, if you've got a Jordan... And you've got, let's say, I don't know, a dead rook. Okay, you got a yep. two hundred. Well, well let's a say, reed or a coffee yield or a horse somewhere in the back. Say, line, yeah, well, someone like that, Radio. That two hundred thousand could mean that you can go Jordan and a, let's say Harley Reed, and you mm -hmm. can go out and let's say you missed Ollie Dempsey on the weekend. You can go and grab an Ollie Dempsey and a Tom Powell, and you're actually making money on these guys, and it's at a much quicker rate than what you're actually doing with the other guys. So yeah. I just don't think it's that hard, really. I think it's a no-brainer. you just got to sometimes spend a bit of less, add a bit of less, but someone like an Ollie Dempsey can definitely fill that F6, F5 rookie on field, as we saw last week. Oh, he patrolled that wing beautifully i think he's going to pick up dpb for us as well there's six or seven more guys i want to ask you about as well as Powell being yeah. really popular trade option last week it was d'ambrosio who's still got a really attainable break even in the low 40s averaging in the low 80s and just under 600k so for those with a whore caulfield or reed i know there's about a hundred thousand between two of them and reed but it's only about 230k from a caulfield and marty whore up to a D'Ambrosio or another 100k on top of that if you're a Zach Reed owner has you know is it too late if you've missed him is is it just not you've got to let him go and look elsewhere or is there still some relevance and value to consider him as a trading option I think there's definitely value still there um and you, it depends on the team yeah so if you're set up with a D6, would I go suggesting you to spend 200000 on Howell's head to get mm. uh, Massimo in? And I'm calling him Massimo because I don't want to murder that surname, okay? <laughs> so, no, I wouldn't recommend that because I think 200000 can be spent better elsewhere. Yep, that's fair enough too. Um, I want to talk to you about three kind of top-line premium midfielders and get your take on them. And then there's a quick conversation I want to have the rucks before we wrap up this episode. You mentioned a Marcus Bontempelli. He's finally down to six figures for us. He's surprisingly not even averaging the ton for us yet, which is crazy, but a 136 break even at the moment. Historically, he, that's well within his attainability, but based on 2024 data, it's not there at the case. I know I'm going to put two other premiums that are coming down in price pretty cheaply, but it looks like he's going to bottom out around 950k in the next two weeks for us. 
are we just like got a hot high prioritize this one, Riz, or are there some other ones that are more likely to come our way? It all depends. He's had that role, but on the weekend, he sort of lost that role halfway through the game. I think mm. we're overstating how West Coast is as an opposition. I think that's actually been seen as a in-game rest and managing of players. We know Bontempelli went into last week with an ankle inquiry. Um, yep. And I say inquiry because I don't know if it was real or not, the injury. But sure. there was some sort of awareness about his ankle, you know, going into yeah. the game. He played great. But the thing was, he burst out, okay? He had the monster first quarter, and then he yep. sat pretty much forward, rotated around, just yep. lost interest. He just couldn't be bothered, yeah? There was and no – look, went, Libba bang, got bang. benched. Like, clearly, that was just low issue of that. I, I'm with you that they definitely treated that game as a bit and of the a in-game guy. And then the last quarter, he salvaged the game. But the fact that he's – if he actually was at full throttle, he may have scored 200 last week. So I don't think we lead too much into what happened last week when it comes to Bontepelli. Yep. Um, the thing we do read is he's dropping in price. Now, Big whether time. he goes lower than 130, you know, what did you say, 950? Uh, look, I mean, that 136 break even is attainable from Bontepelli against anyone. Like... So if you want Bontempelli and you got the coin, he he's value right now compared to what mm. I think he could do. But then yeah, everyone definitely. could say that about everyone, yeah? That's true. Talk to me about Errol Goulden. He's a couple weeks away from a buy. Well, it's not a couple. It's one week away. So no one's making the move pre-buy because he, along with Heaney, along with Grundy, along with Roberts, along with Jordan, and along with Dacos as well. All going to be missing round five. So we're looking at this as early at round six. If he goes at his average, which again, under 100, which he was, for many, was a safe top line premium, and he's been fine. He's just not been 110 plus fine. He could be as low as 900K for us coming off the buy, depending on how it goes this week. It's about a 60, 70K difference potentially on what Bont and Pelly will be in two weeks' time. Where do you rank the golden trading consideration post-buy? I think there's enough question marks to park it for a while. I in terms of see... role? No, I think it's more about his teammates, MJ. What's the one biggest difference between now and last year when Goulden was going nuts? Oh, someone's in the midfield, that's for sure. And Gordon's no longer number one midfield right now. It's going mm. through Haney. So yeah. and we, we've we we've talked about having like a thirst, like a hunger. Haney's bloody hungry right now, okay? He's got a <laughs> point to prove. Is he ever? He's been given this midfield role that he's been yearning for for years. And then suddenly Longmire's just giving him the key to the midfield. Away you go. And he is running, Brodio, and he's bloody hungry. The he's fact of the matter is, he's not letting anyone else eat at this point in time because Isaac no. Heaney only knows one way. So when he gets the ball, MJ, he's not looking sideways to the wing. He's going oh, straight sorry. down into the 50, okay? That's how he plays. We've all seen it. When Heaney... Like, let's say when Tay comes back, when Parker mm. comes back, the whole lot comes back, Mills, what happens with Heaney? He may very well end up back forward. If sure. he does go forward, that's when you go, oh, Goulden's back in town because we've seen it before last year, yeah, with Goulden. But yeah, we, we never definitely saw have. Goulden with Heaney as hungry as he is right now. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, talk to me then about Clary Oliver, because I, I do want to hit a couple of rucks quickly before we wrap up the episode. A again, he's on the buy after round six, so we've got a couple of weeks. Then he's going to miss. So 95 average at the moment, 133, much like Bont and Errol. History would say attainable, but 2024 would say, no, 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 he's, he's going to drop under 900K. 
different set of circumstances, I suppose, with them. Errol's got some role questions. Uh, Bont is a little bit unique with the matchup that just came up last week, whereas Oliver didn't have a preseason. Um, is this the main priority off the early season buys that we should be going for? I think off his buy, he runs into Richmond in round seven. And then he goes over and plays against Geelong the week after. He goes Carlton, and then he goes Eagles, St Kilda, Fremantle. That's wow. as friendly as you can get around that round seven. That's when I would be targeting for a Clary Oliver. And guess what, MJ? That coincides with the new defence positions we were just talking about. It's almost like you could potentially look at moving a Zach Williams type. Uh, up into your midfield and fade a McKercher, a Bonner, uh, whoever you need to into your back line, all of a sudden with a couple of hundred K on top of it, um, happy days. So how yeah. about this, MJ? And I don't want to tell people how to play. Please. Williams can be a downgrade to whoever the rookie is at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Riley Bonner could then have enough money to be put on his head to be called Clary Oliver. At round yeah, seven. it could be 150, 200k easily. Yep. So that's what it's we're looking Last. at right now. All right. Okay. Uh, the three rucks I want to talk about before we wrap up the episode. Max Gorn owners are just loving the start to the year because he's given you everything. And that is scores well above his price point, captaincy level scoring, and he's increasing your team value. Is that at the point now it's always dangerous to say, the K word. Um, this is heading into keeper level territories where if you're an owner, you're not even looking at English or Marshall. This, this is as good as we could have asked for for, for Max Gorn owners, isn't it? Yes, it is. And you know what? If I didn't own Max Gorn right now, I'd be petrified, MJ. <laughs> yeah. Because now yep. it's my stubbornness. I missed him at the lower price point is preventing me to have fixed this a couple of weeks ago with uh, Grundy who was failing at the time. Yep. Yeah, it's it's painful. Now, maybe you're net neutral with all the other moves that are there, but he's not going to run at 120 for the coming 20 weeks, but he doesn't have to. The damage has been done. It's been very done right now, and you're taking a very big leap of faith right now that the other guys are going to match Gorn with what we've mm. seen already. Because well, Gorn's the he is a gun. There's no problems about oh, that. But this is the first time we've seen him as a sole ruck in a team for what years. was it, four or five years, six years, yeah. whatever it was. Yeah. There's no and – and everyone's saying he's a bit old in the tooth. He's a ruckman, and 32 is not old in the tooth for a ruckman. This mm -hmm. guy is inarguably – he's in the – his form, like he's right at that age where he should be peaking. Yep. And, I mean, don't be stubborn about it because it's he's only gone up 104000 for the year. It's not mm -hmm. like he's put you out of – owning him it's just that oh, yeah. you've been stubborn because you've chosen someone that hasn't quite popped or generated the cash it's the same quite like it's the same argument with cherry yeah like same if the two right now hindsight will tell us gorn cherry was the combination without okay? question points cash gen whatever okay we had that raging discussion in the preseason. well what is it what is it like, the fact of the matter was, it may not be two. It could have been three. But Gorn and Cherry, if you're talking about just the three, are clear number ones right now and clear ahead of the pack. And if you have Gorn and Grundy, for instance, mm -hmm. and you've been stubborn not to make that Grundy to Cherry trade a couple of weeks ago when it was just sitting there to bank a bit of cash, and mm -hmm. Like, you've done yourself a disservice. You've got to go and find that extra 150, 200, 250. Who knows where it ends up, yeah? Cash yeah, generation right. that's not cherry. That's the yeah. problem is the cash generation. 
And then you talk about it, Tim English. He's destined to drop under a million dollars this week, despite going fine. Um, and again, really just eased off in that last quarter against West Coast. He was definitely heading towards a 130 if he really wanted to push it. And Marshall, another. That sure, both are attainable break evens. They're both around that 130, 140 market, depending on the format. It's getting to this interesting point, Rids, for us, where in a couple of weeks' time, Cherry will hit his topped out point, Grundy will hit his topped out point, and non Gorn owners now have a decision to make between these three. Gorn owners don't have to worry about that. Then they're starting to look at either Marshall or English and, and even the option if they wanted to as well of just running the other value guys through there. So it's going to get to an interesting point in about two and a half, three weeks' time, Rids, where people that are looking at a upgrade cadence going, okay, Cherry's pretty much maxed out. Gorn. Gorn is now heading towards the high 900,000s. English is there. Marshall is there. Oh, boy, that's going to be an interesting decision to make for people in about three weeks' time. And there's no reason why it can't be both. Yeah. Okay. It could be five weeks of Marshall, and then you might flip him and have six weeks of English. You mm. don't have to select people with the thought process that they're going to be in your team at the end of the year. No, that's true. Yeah, it's a really good one. Hey, Rids, you've given us some plenty of stuff to process in a short and condensed week for AFL Fantasy with Gather Round kicking off Thursday night and really footy ending only on Monday night. So not a heap of time for us to make some decisions, but you've given us some great stuff to process through over sort of 48 hours or less than that now before the start of Gather Round. So as always, mate, an absolute pleasure chatting to you about AFL Fantasy. So we should really finish with this uh what is it tim's league um the content creators cup so oh yes the content creators cup i yes. want to celebrate you here mj <laughs> so you want to tell the listeners out there what happened on the weekend no no let's not do that because that's putting me in adelaide crows territory which is what you win a game you should win a game uh and if you haven't won one that's okay but you should win a game yes I won a game this week, Rids. And guess what? How did mate? you go? My luck was actually flicked, and I won a game as well, and I didn't lose oh, a close there you one. Go. There I you got go. over the top All of right. Calvinator, and you. you got over the top of who was it? Dunkley uh, Donuts. I think was it was it Zach. No, no, nah, nah, Sanchez Snags. Snags. Yeah, uh, there Sanchez you go. Snags. So I got. So um, at this point in time, the coaches' panels going okay. Mini Monk's still undefeated, but of course he is. Yeah, but let's let's just call out that I do rank a little bit higher than him this week. So I'm oh, gonna okay. call that out right now yeah. because it's know. unlikely to stay that way for the year. But I did tell him a couple of months ago that I'm coming for his title this year, mate. Coming for his hat. That's what you're doing. Well, if you're worried uh, or curious about how it's going down, uh, Rids is taking on fellow coaches, panellists, and Pod Pod member Louis. So that's going to be interesting. Mini Monk is taking on one of the AFL Fantasy Fanatics in Tim Guest. Uh, I've got another one. I've got Bales this week. So interesting to see how it's all going to play. Uh, I'm no longer on the bottom of the ladder. So that's a, I don't know if I ever actually got there, but it's good that I'm not there anyway. So happy days. Thanks for bringing that up, uh, Rids. Uh, we'll keep keeping you up to date with how that's all playing. If you are curious, where's Mini Monk? Uh, I think he's a uh, joint leader. There's four guys that are undefeated at the moment. Mini Monk is one of those, along with uh, Roy, DC, and Bales. So some nice work from those guys. Hey, if you've been listening to this episode, thank you so much for tuning in. We so greatly appreciate it. If you haven't subscribed or given a five-star rating to this podcast, it's not too late. You can do that. If you want to join our Patreon supporter group, they get a bunch of different rewards during the round, whether it be up at that premium tier level where they get the weekly round review. It's the Q&A podcast or just a bunch of other rewards during the season. You can join that with all the details in the description of this episode and if you're watching on youtube you've clearly seen a different location for me but wanted to still get you this episode while i was away on some holidays if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet do that comment below and let us know what your trade plans are for this week we'll get in touch with you there and make sure you've turned the notification on so as soon as a new episode drops
drops, whether it be the strategy roundtables or something else that's coming real soon, you'll be notified of that immediately. Hey, good Same luck Jay, in this round. Before yes. you sign off, yes, everyone that follows Coach's Panel or MJ on Twitter, make sure oh, you man. shout out to him next week because it's his 40th birthday. So the fella's Thanks, getting mate. old, okay? Thanks, mate. I mean, I'm getting old and, uh, you know, we'll see how long the hair lasts for. But for now, it's intact and it's mostly its original colour. So let, let's see how we go. I'm not sure if it's the age, three kids, or or just life in general that ages you. So, yes, we, we've got a strategy roundtable to get to before that, though, Rid. So I've still got at least one more in me. Uh, actually, i got a couple more uh, before I hit that milestone marker. So thank you for that. Hey, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And good luck this week as we head into round four. It's gather round, a big week of footy. The Finn McGuinness tag is coming and 22 players on field. I look forward to talking with you real soon about AFL Fantasy again.